we've got a, a special guest tonight. We might bring him in. Um, we will, yeah, we'll bring him in right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Tonight, we are joined by a man who played 94 games over seven seasons in the NRL, which included 43 for our wonderful Warriors during 2007-2008. Uh, we're pleased to be joined by Warrior number 134, Michael Witt. Hey, Michael, how you going, bro? Gentlemen, thanks for having me. Yeah, You're no, sideways. No, you need to turn your phone. Perfect. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Awesome. Uh, Michael, thanks heaps for joining us tonight. Um, we might we might take you back to the start of your, your rugby league journey. Can you tell us a bit about where you grew up and uh, who you played your junior footy for? Yeah, I grew up in uh, a small town called Toowoomba in Queensland. Um, played all my junior footy for the Newtown Lions. Um, come from a, a family of uh, football. My dad played. Uh, my older brother played at the time. And, um, yeah, we were always a football family. And mum was involved. My younger brother was involved. So footy was uh, footy was life for us, uh, Whip Boys. You're, you're a pretty talented junior, too, coming through the ranks up there in Queensland. You represented Queensland under-15s and under-16s in 1999 and 2000. Um, that must have been a huge honour. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I guess... Um, it was something that every kid who grows up in Queensland, they always want to wear a maroon jersey. Um, I was lucky enough, I think 13, um, 13 through to about 16. So yeah, I, I played in the Queensland teams uh, before I moved, uh, moved to Sydney and, and off to Parramatta. Yeah, so, so as you said, you, you moved to Sydney. So that was about 1999 and you're offered a scholarship with Parramatta. Um, and to, to join your brother, Steve, who was also at the Eels. So that must have been an exciting time yeah. for you. Yeah, it was. It was, um, you know, looking back on it now, I think it's, it sounds pretty crazy that I moved to, from a little town to Woomber, I moved to the big smoke of Sydney at the age of 16. Um, I've got kids now. There's no way I'd let them move away at 16. But um, at the time, it was just, you know, we wanted to play in the NRL and um, that's what you had to do. We obviously had no uh, local NRL team in Toowoomba. So, um, yeah, got down to Sydney. And obviously, as you just said, my, my older brother was already down there. So that made the transition a little bit easier. And and Parramatta was a fantastic club. They they set us up with a host family. So I lived with uh, three or four other players um, where they cooked and uh, cleaned for us. So it was, um, yeah, made the transition a bit easier. Yeah, Wood is a 16-year-old. You um, you spent the 2000, from 2000, 2002 playing in Parramatta's lower grades, which included yep. the, um, the 2002 SG Ball Grand Final where your Eels were beaten by the Western Suburbs Magpies, 18-16. How yes. do you remember your time in the lower grades? Um, because that Parramatta side that you came through had some some pretty outstanding players. I think it was about nine of you that all went on to play first grade. Yeah, I, was, um, I still look at it. I'm, I feel very privileged to have come through the junior system at Parramatta. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, program. Um, headed by Brian Smith, who sort of mm. was the head coach there at the time. But we had a, a really successful period. We always won the club championship um, and they were really, really good coaching wise, some fantastic coaches through the grades um, and they put a lot of detail into our training and I feel like that um, progressing through my career um, held me in good stead in terms of skill factor. Yeah. Yeah, it was a career, it was a career ending injury to Paul Green, unfortunately, that saw you made your first grade debut in round yeah. uh, eight of 2002. Um, against the yep. Sydney Roosters. Um, you lose that game 44 to 12, but what are your personal memories of that, uh, obviously that exciting milestone game for yourself? Yeah, well, the, the, the Roosters had just won the grand final. So um, they yeah. were, and if you can remember that Roosters team, uh, early 2000s, they were just beasts. They, they sort of really based their game around defence and they flew in and really, really physical team. Uh, so that was quite daunting. I still remember Nathan Kalis telling me that, um, you know, he was excited for me to play and he was my captain at the time and he felt that my game was was good for the Roosters because they race up quick and I had a good show and go. I don't know whether he believed it because I certainly didn't. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he was going, no, you'll be good. You'll be good through the middle. You'll, you'll scare them. And they certainly weren't scared of me. But um, uh, I, I do remember marking up against Brad Fittler and him trying to run players at me. Um, yeah, <laughs> I remember him calling run at wit and I didn't care who was sending it at me. The fact that Brad Fickler knew my name, I was pretty, pretty <laughs> stoked with that. So, um, yeah. yeah, it was just a whirlwind, I guess. We, um, you don't have to remind us about the, 
Roosters teams were the 2000s, mate. Yes. That's Warriors. Well, exactly. Yeah, we're exactly. very aware of how good the Roosters teams were. Especially 2002, yeah. 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 Um, we're always of the opinion that, that players always remember their first NRL try. However, we've been proven wrong a few times because most yeah. of our recent guests, when we ask them, they have no idea who they scored their first try against. Do you <laughs> remember when you scored your first NRL try and who it was against? Yeah, I do. I do. I think it was my third game. Uh, we played Manly at Brookvale. Yep. And I, I stepped past my good mate, Beaver Menzies, to score a try. So uh, a few few years later, he was my, my teammate there. So I uh, yeah definitely got that one in quick that uh, he helped me yeah. in for my first try. Yeah. Yeah, you lost your first four games as a first grader, though. Um, yep. Do you do you remember your first NRL victory? It was round twelve against South in uh, verse uh, twenty eight to four win at the Footy Stadium, was it? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah I didn't. I didn't know that was our first first win, but <laughs> that uh, was your first win. Your first win. My, first, my yeah. first win. Sorry. Your yeah, my first, first, first win. win. Yeah. 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 Well, as I say, we played the Roosters in my first game. They won the grand final. We played the Warriors. My second game, and they got beaten in the grand final. Yeah. I, by the way, missed two goals that game, and we should have won that. We lost by two, so I remember that uh, vividly. That it was basically my fault that we lost. Um, so yeah, let's let's just talk about when we got the first win. I was going to say you can't blame yourself, mate. They could score closer to the post, couldn't they? To make it easy for you. That no, it was a problem. They weren't too far far from the post. <laughs> <laughs> That's the <a> problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mate, you played you played seventeen games in first grade um, that that first season, and you became a real integral yeah. part of that Parramatta's push for a, an unlikely finals berth, which yep. ultimately falls just short. Um, at the time, being at Parramatta, there was, there's always a lot of hype about um, guys coming in wearing the number seven and and being yep. the the club's answer to the next Peter Sterling. Um, yep. Did you feel a lot of pressure at that time? Because uh, I know it's affected other. Sevens that have come through that club? Yeah, certainly a big thing. And, and you're right. As soon as you have a couple of good games in the lower grades, you're the saviour uh, and, the, the, and the next best halfback since since Sterlow. So, um, yeah, that was definitely thrown at me. I, you know, looking back, I think, yeah, it probably was dawning at the time. I sort of didn't draw too much attention to it. Um, I was just stoked to be playing there. Um, I felt like I was going okay. Um, the team sort of turned around and we did go close to making the semis. Um, so it was okay. Um, I just feel like, yeah, towards the back end, you know, we really would have capped it off. We could have won our last game and made the semis, but, um, you yeah, know, it wasn't the beat. It came down to a shootout with, with uh, Penrith in the last round, didn't it? And you guys yeah, had to, did. you got out to a 10 nil lead or something and it looked like a miracle yeah. was going to happen. I remember that well. Yeah. yeah. Rob's yeah, got we did. Rob's got a photographic memory. He remembers every game that every team plays, every score, every try is just is just weird. Is that right? <laughs> did you did you kick a field goal or something against Brisbane maybe a week or two earlier? Yeah, I did actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I remember Three. that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that was um, my first game at the at the new SunCorp at the time. Yeah, I remember and, it was uh, just new that year. Yeah, yeah, I can remember because the the grass they were always blow ups about the grass because it wasn't growing properly. It was all sandy and yeah, yuck. But right. um, yeah. Yeah, we ended up winning by a couple of points that day. And I remember that specific game where Gordy was ripping into me and saying, where are you going for Mad Monday? Um, <laughs> oh, so we're not going for Mad Monday because pretty much between us and them, we was both right on the verge of making the semis. And um, yeah, I, I was giving him a bit of lip, but I'm thinking, geez, I hope this doesn't escalate because I'll run. I'll be the first one up there, grandstand. No, you got the last laugh anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, to, well, on to 2004, it's a bit of a disappointing season for the Eels and you end up signing with Manly for 2005. So uh, what was the reason for your move to, uh, over to the Northern Beaches? Yeah, it was really random. As you say, I sort of finished 2003, um, not too bad. Um, Brian Smith had a change of mind in the, in the off-season. He was going to change the way that we played as a team um, and wanted to just have one half. Um, pardon me. Um, so that sort of changed. Adam Dykes was the number one half. And um, then we played with two locks, which was a bit of a strange setup. Uh, as you say, I sort of come back in towards the end of the year and we went back to the um, normal footy. But um, yeah, basically just got a phone call one day driving my car from Crusher Cleal, who was the guy who signed me at Parramatta. And he was now at Manly. Um, and he, he effectively just said, you know why I'm calling? And I said, well, uh, no, I don't. What's, what's doing? And he's like, well, we've just lost Andrew Walker. Um, so we need a 5'8", and we want you to come over. So 
pretty much from that phone call, I think within the next uh, two or three days, I'd, I'd signed and was was off to Manly. 2005 was a successful season for Manly too. Um, saw the club return to the yeah. finals footy for the first time since, uh, I think, 98. Um, yep. You enjoyed a successful story, a season scoring 140 points. How do, you, how do you remember your time at Manly or that season at Manly? Yeah, you're right. It was, it was a pretty successful season. We started really well. Um, I don't think that had too much to do with, with me going there. We were pretty privileged uh, that I went over the time we saw, uh, signed myself. Uh, Brent Kite and um, Ben Kennedy. Ben Kennedy, ben Kennedy come right, from yeah. Newcastle. And, and BK was, um, you know, everyone knows the sort of player that he was, but he certainly come to Manly with that winning attitude. And, and we really uh, run off the back of him. And he was playing fantastic footy, playing for Australia. And so was Brent Kite at the time. So they added heaps to the club. Um, guys like Anthony Watmo started to run off the back of what BK was doing. And yeah, as you say, we, we got back to the finals. Um, I had to be beat by Parramatta. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you said, but as you say that rugby league has plenty of sliding doors moments and yes. you're suspended and you're ineligible to play the first two trials in 2006. And a young mm-hmm. bloke by the name of Travis Burns uh, comes in and grabs his opportunity and Desi decides exactly. to go with him uh, for the yep. start of the season. So that must yep. have been a bit of a bitter pill to swallow for you after having such a good 2005 with Manly. Yeah, it was. You know, I, I trained all the preseason at five eight, and the last uh, last couple of weeks before the sem- uh, excuse me the the trials, he put Trav in there because I was, as you say, I was suspended for the first two weeks, um, so ineligible to play. And Trav come in there, and you know, it's as as it is, it's hard to change a winning team. And Travis come in and and was just solid, uh, very very strong defensive player, and he just tied up one edge, um, and the boys were winning, so it was hard to change that team and. Every week, I think Des would tell me, no, no, you'll play next week, you'll play next week. But the boys were pretty successful that year. And, um, yeah, I didn't get much of a look in. You um, you find yourself on the move at the end of that season um, and you end up at our wonderful Warriors. How did that yeah. move come about? Yeah, I just uh, my manager just basically let me know that um, the Warriors were watching me. Um, I remember uh, uh, John Hart um, mm-hmm. come over to watch me play reserve grade game. Um for Manly, I think we were at Henson Park and I'd had a lot of needles to play that game. I was a bit worried and the needles didn't work and I thought, oh no, it's not uh, not going to go well for me here and the Warriors might want me, but um, lucky enough, yeah, they still uh, wanted me to come over. So um, we signed for one year and we decided myself and my, my wife that uh, we're going to take the plunge and um, I was a little bit worried and hesitant to start with as to go to, to Auckland. All I knew about Auckland was flying to the hotel driving to Mount Smart and straight back to the hotel. Yep. Uh, so it was pretty daunting. Uh, but I spoke to my old mate, and uh, Steve Price, uh, and Pricey told me that uh, it was a fantastic club, a fantastic place. Uh, if I was playing good enough footy, I'd, I'd be in first grade. So um, that's all I needed to hear from him. And um, I certainly trusted and respected him. Uh, once he said that, we uh, we signed straight away and we're ready to roll. The weather must have been a, a big difference for you going from the beautiful sun, sun and <laughs> surf of the northern beaches to the uh, cold yeah. uh, environment of Auckland. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. It was uh, certainly a change of uh, change of environment. But um, yeah, as I say, once once we got to uh, Auckland, we loved it. Myself and my wife, and um, yeah, we never wanted to leave. To be fair, we had a great time there. Yeah. yeah, you said you mentioned Steve Price. I always thought he should have been a recruitment manager for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he should have. For that. Yeah, mate, he um, was. Uh, when, when when I first went there, he was just under the prime minister, Pricey. He was, yeah. uh, yep. you know, the most loved Australian New Zealand's ever seen. So yep. um, he was uh, basically running the show. That's for sure. Yeah, he was. <laughs> when you get when you get there in two thousand and seven, we have a pretty good start to that year. So we have two strong yep. wins against Parramatta and Brisbane. And then we have a bit of a mid-season slump, which becomes has become a bit of a theme of, of that sort of period yep. for the Warriors. Um, but yep. a wet and windy night at Shark Park is a turning point in our season. And in yeah. this match, you kick one of the greatest conversions in rugby league history <laughs> into yeah. the teeth and the rain and the howling winds. Uh, what do you remember about that kick? Um, I, I remember it being an important kick when I was lining it up, but uh, obviously just... The wind was pretty crazy, so I thought I've just got to pick a spot and kick it straight at that spot. Um, and was lucky enough that it went over. But uh, I think that the the 
the commentator, I've watched it since, and he's he basically made it sound better than it was. He said he's unkickable, he can't <laughs> kick it, it's impossible. So that sort of adds to the adds to the uh, the folklore of it all. But um, yeah, it was uh, one of those ones you hit, close your eyes, and hopefully it goes through. And lucky enough, it did. You actually you actually went on a pretty long goal kicking streak after taking over from Tony Martin that season. I yep. think you kicked you kicked twenty three from twenty three over the next five games, and you end up kicking an incredible sixty two from sixty seven that season. Had you always been a kicker growing up? Yeah, always a goal kicker. Uh, yep. Always a goal kicker as a kid. Uh, kicker coming through the grades and and kicked all my time at Parramatta and Manly. Um, it was something that I I really enjoyed, and it's it's I guess goal kicking. Um, if it comes natural to you, then that's great. But you've certainly got to put a lot of effort into it, and it's something that I always spent time on. Um, yep. I changed probably my practice routine a little bit once I come to New Zealand um, and that really started to work for me. So, um, yeah, I was managing to, to hit them quite nicely and um, it's just one of those things, I guess, like a golf swing. It's, it's all about confidence and every time you put the ball down, you just feel like it's going over. Um, it's a nice, nice place to be. We won plenty of games off the back of your trusty goal kicking. And speaking yeah. of kicking, I'm going to bring up something that's not a, not a kick at goal. One of the greatest, one of the most memorable games of the modern era is a 31 all draw against the Roosters at the SFS. Uh, this yep. is a game I was lucky enough to go with with my cousin, who's a mad um, Roosters fan. It was a yep. real seesawing game. It just were, it uh, they got out to a 16 0 lead. We got back to 18 16. It just kept going back and forward. And it got yep. to a 30 all after uh, Simon Mannering was Simbin. And then Braith and Asta kicks a, a mammoth field goal to put, put them up 31 30. Yep. And then you you step up to the plate with less than a minute left on the clock, the ice man, and and slot over a uh, match leveling field goal. What do you remember about that game? Yeah, seesawing affair, as you said. I um I remember Hami Lawaki. That game yeah. just just killed him. He was he just had a sort of fifteen minute period where he was unstoppable, and he brought us right back into the game. Yeah, he, did uh, he was outstanding. Yeah. Uh, also, I remember a couple of – I had a kick right from the sideline there. I remember the Roosters fan just giving me an absolute hiding. Uh, as you can imagine, with the last name of Witt, there's plenty of things that go in front of Witt. But, uh, yep. I've heard them all. I've heard them all, but I was coughing plenty that day. But lucky enough that we got it through. And, um, yeah, just come down to that that last that last um, minute there. We, we'd always practice. We always had a set to practice for our field goals. So, um, we just sort of fell into routine and what we knew we needed to do and, Again, lucky enough that it went through. We um, the club going go on a bit of a run at the back end of that 07 season. We finished fourth and yep. and a home final against the Eels. Um, yeah. Despite losing that game, having a home semi final at Mount Smart Stadium must have been a huge uh, thing for the club at that time. Yeah, it was. It was huge, and uh, I think that was a, a night they did the blackout. Um, so all the crowd was wearing black. Mm. Uh, it's pretty daunting uh, and amazing to run out through the tunnel. Um, and see that. And I think um, whilst, as you say, we lost that game, that held us in good stead for the final series the next year after. And um, I guess coming home to another big game at home, um, that I think that helped us there. But really close game that day against Parramatta. And we just, um, a couple of little things didn't go our way and we, we just missed out. But uh, yeah, to go from there and then lose the next week as well and go out in straight sets after uh, finishing the top four was, yeah, tough. Yeah, I was yeah. just, just going to say, the next week we famously went up to Townsville to play the Cowboys yep. in, in the afternoon heat for some reason up there. Yeah. And they, and they forced us to wear our black jerseys because they decided they to do the old switch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we remember that. <laughs> we, uh, we all yeah. remember that. Don't worry. <laughs> I've still got a bit of a chip on my shoulder with the Cowboys for that, Toddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so obviously a very disappointing end to what was otherwise a really good season for the club. Is that is that yep. how you look back on the 2007 season? Season? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's um, you know, it's always every year you look you look to win the grand final, but you know, there's only ever one team that can do that. So, um, on a whole, I think yeah, you'd say it was a, a pretty successful year, making uh, or finishing in the top four. Um, obviously, a frustrating finish with the two losses, but um, yeah, I think if you look back on a whole, it was a pretty successful year, and um, yeah, it's it's fond memories of that year, that's for sure. Mm. Yeah, the um the two two thousand eight season we started off again pretty slowly. You picked up a hip, hip flexor injury and you ruled out for the mid portion of the season. Yep. Um, but your return to first grade coincided with another of our famous runs towards the finals. Uh, you know, there's a story there about the club wanting to get rid of 
Reuben Wiki and and the yep. boys all uh, having Reuben's back. And you all grow beards for the occasion, uh, yep. inspired by Reuben's impending retirement. I have to ask, what was happening with your facial hair, bro? Like, <laughs> you, you had, I, I, I can comment because I can grow a nice full beard. You, bro, you have, like, I can't. You had the no, dirty scratch happening and a little go. Like, what? <laughs> Yeah, what was the go with that? <laughs> Just it had to be some sort of facial hair. Um, yep. And funny you say that it was it was to do with Ruben. It actually had nothing to do with Rubes. Uh, but what that was that? the common. Uh, no, no, that was the common uh, consensus in because we did really make a pact. Thing. We we did make yeah. a pact as a team that no one was going to talk about it. We refused to talk about it. Um, and if anyone mentioned it, we just sort of brushed it off. So the actual real story was, I was sitting beside. Um, Craig Walker, who was our trainer at the time. Yep. We were flying over to play. Uh, it was Ruben's big game, 300th game mm. against Tigers. the Tigers. Leichardt. So yeah, Tigers. out at Leichardt. So we were sitting in there and and um, Craig Walker beside me on the plane is reading Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated. He's reading about uh, the ice hockey. Uh, in the Stanley Cup, they always grow beards during the final series. Um you know, they've always done it. And he's like, oh, that'd be cool. I said, we'll, we'll do it. We should do it. He goes, do you think the boys will buy in? I said, 100%. But the boys will buy in and say, you know, we're all buying in. You've got to have some sort of facial hair. Let's do it. So that day, uh, once we got to the hotel, he called a meeting in, in um, it was in Ruben's bedroom, actually. And uh, yeah. so we all went in there and we decided we all bought in. Everybody needed to have some sort of facial hair. Even if it was a bit of fluff on your top lip that could blow off in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> it needed to be some sort of facial hair, and um, and also at the same same meeting, we said we, we're not going to mention it. Um, so no one spoke about it. But uh, as you say, it gathered momentum, and and you know yeah. the crowd was turning up with beards on. It was awesome. Yeah, it was. It was very. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, that was it. Was it was a great spectacle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but from beards back to your goal kicking. Uh, again, you kick. You're kicking it at a mate. You kicked it at an amazing eighty three point one percent in two thousand and eight to follow previous season of 92.5 percent so at that time yeah. did you did you put any extra kicking uh, extra practice into your kicking or was it you just hitting them really sweet at that time uh it, it wasn't um extra practice it was just a different practice uh as i sort of said earlier i always used to practice a hell of a lot with my goal kicking i'd always go on my day off everybody would have usually in the nrl program you get a day off during the week uh all the boys would have a day off and i'd go and kick on my own mm. And so it have to go through the warm up and do all that sort of stuff. And you could never really hit them as good um, when you weren't warm and fully into training. So I'd change that. Um, I used to go do the session and then go and kick on my own after the session whilst I was already warm and flexy and um, ready to go. Um, even if it was a tough fitness session, I'd, I'd try and do that mental side of it and go and kick after the session. Um, so I always did that in Auckland and I'd never done that before. So that was probably a little change to my uh, practice routine. Um, once or twice a week, and then I'll have a couple of shots, um, you know, the day before the game. But um, yeah, it wasn't a hell of a change, but it was it's something that really seemed to work for me. Did you did you have a goal kicking coach? Like you know how a lot of the guys now use some of the ex-players, like Daryl Halligan does a lot of work with yep. different clubs and stuff. Did you have a, a actual goal kicking coach yourself? Yeah, I had a few during my time. Um, when I first came through at Parramatta, Jason Taylor was my was my yeah, coach of my team. Uh, so he was my goal kicking coach, and and he's the one I probably give most credit to. He really um, manufactured my style. I was a natural striker of the ball, but he helped me helped me with my routine, and he helped me with when I missed a kick, I, I knew why I'd missed. Um, yep. And I think once you've got that in your repertoire, you know why you missed. It's easy to rectify and fix. Um, from there, I went to Graham Arnold, who was a kicking oh, coach. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. At, um, and, and a soccer soccer guy, but just mm. a real natural striker of the ball. He put a little change on my style. Um, and then we worked with Daryl Halligan when I was at the Warriors. And he, again, just a really slight little change um, with the way I set the ball up. Um, so try to take a little bit out of all those guys and then put your own little mix on it. But I was certainly privileged and lucky to work with some, some great kickers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now for the game and the moment that all Warriors fans have been asking us about, um, <laughs> that 2008 final against the Storm uh, down in yep. Melbourne. Now, we'll get to that try in a minute, yep. but um, the game itself, how confident were the boys heading into that game? Because we did have a, a relatively decent record against Melbourne. Um, yep. 
around that time period? Yeah, we did. We did. We'd, we'd always done well against them down there and even, you know, and at Mount Smart as well. But we were really confident. Um, we'd, we'd had a number of victories in a row. Um, so I think it was seven or eight straight. So we were confident. We were playing confident footy. Um, nobody, nobody give us any hope other than the, the 17 guys and the coaching staff. But we were really confident going down there. Uh, I still remember the chat during, in the week that we weren't going to go down there like many teams are and defeated before the game starts. Um, they sort of play a lot of mind games with you. Um, they always let you run out in the field and let you stand there and wait. Uh, just little things like that. And then they play the, sun, the thunderstruck music and yeah. they run through the big banner. And We decided that as a team, and Craig Walker was a big a mental, um, being on the mental side of the game, we decided that when we run out, we were going to form like a line right in the middle of halfway and, and basically... Not, almost like a hucker, I guess. You, you're standing there waiting to, um, you know, just challenge them and say, we're not coming here to make up the numbers. And uh, we did that. I still remember a couple of the guys running through the banner and as they busted through, uh, looking at us like, shit, you know, what's what's going on here? And <laughs> when you got guys like Ruben Wiki and those guys standing there staring you down, you, you know, okay, we're in, for a, we're in for a real game here today. And, um, yeah, it was a really close game the whole way through. Apparently Ian Henderson had a bit to say at that point as well. <laughs> he did, and Hendo was he was such a <laughs> such a tough player, uh, yeah. unforgiving. He he only knew one way. Hendo it was run hard, tackle hard, and and take no prisoners. And that's yeah. the way he played. And he he did stand there. And you can you can probably see him. He's yelling at him. He's just ready. And he was he was one of those guys that you think he's one of the little dudes in the team, and he's going full tilt, you know. And um, yeah, as I say, he's one of those guys that that led. Uh, didn't say too much. He'd give a few sprays, that's for sure. But uh, <laughs> he was a guy that, um, yeah, he, he put his whole heart into it and that sort of rubbed off on the rest of us. He had, he had a little bit of crazy man syndrome about him, didn't he? And, you know? Oh, I wouldn't say it was a little bit. He had a hell of a lot of crazy <laughs> man. <laughs> and he had, he had one of the best beards. He had the most powerful beard. Yeah, he beard. did. did. Yeah, so he, did. he was uh, yeah. Yeah, quite menacing at, at that point in time. And, uh, yeah. A lovely guy too, really softly spoken, gentleman off the off the field, but absolute lunatic on it. <laughs> lunatic on the drink too. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. No, he's, he's always fondly remembered, Hendo. Always fondly yeah. remembered among Warriors faithful. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, please talk us through that final try. Um, is it true? Is it true that you were just trying to waste time? And also, yeah. what did Feeney say to Cam Smith afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> well. First thing, yeah, I, I did try to uh, waste time. That was my whole idea. Uh, obviously, it doesn't look like, and I've looked back at it since and gone, it doesn't look nothing like that. But my head, that's 100% what I was doing. I knew Blairy was chasing me. Um, so I thought if I can just stop in the corner, Blairy's going to run through and I can stand here for, you know, maybe 20 seconds. Yep. Um, that happened. Blairy went through, but stupid me. Like, I, I didn't think about Smithy. I didn't even see Smithy. Uh, once I seen him coming, you know, he's the ultimate professional. He's always going to chase, and he yeah. did. But, um, again, it looks a bit worse than it is because as I put the ball down, I went to throw the ball in the air and that's when Smithy kicked it. Uh, but uh, on what Feeney said, oh, I don't know, but there was plenty of spit and plenty of... <laughs> and plenty of... Uh, plenty of heckling. It was... Uh, yeah, you probably wouldn't want to repeat most of it. But yeah, uh, he no, certainly got into it. Didn't miss him. <laughs> that, but that was one of the great team tries. I, I mean... I know it was it was a match winning try, but it was actually a yep. really awesome team try. The way that uh, Jerome yeah. and Manu combined and everything, and you backing up as well. Yeah, you're right, and and I sort of I get a lot of not credit, but I get it's always asked about me about what I did. Um, obviously, standing in the corner like a bit of a goose, and that's what people remember. But <laughs> if, if if you go back and rewind that play, um, I just give early ball to Jerome Rapati, who'd done it all year. Uh, he had fantastic footwork and he was really strong. And I just wanted to give him early ball. And he managed to, I forget who his defender was, but he beat him. Oh, it was Falau. Yeah, it he was, beat Falau, like young as he ends up yeah. and, and got through him and uh, grabbed a great pass there to Manu. And, you know, the beast just flying down the sideline. And I don't know how he sort of seen me. I, I went to go on his outside and then he was sort of running there. So I flicked back to his inside and managed to, to open up. And he hit me perfectly. Perfect pass uh, for a big man. Uh, running at that sort of speed in traffic that he was, um, a pretty special pass to come up with. 
Unreal yeah. moment. Unreal. It was. And the, well, the club created, will ever forget. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and the club created history that day as the first eighth place team to defeat the minor premiers in week one of the finals. Yep. How was the mood and celebrations after that win? Um, you know, obviously it probably probably wasn't over the top, uh, knowing no. the game to come, but uh, still Yeah, it wasn't over the top, but um it's funnily enough, in, in the in the in lead up to the game, I remember Walks, uh, Craig Walker talking about we win this, we're gonna get a home game next week. We're a home semi final because of the way the draw fell or whatever. Yep. And um, we're like, you know, we win this, we're going home and no one's gonna beat us back there. Um, I still remember in the lead up to there was a, a um an article on the day of the game or the day before the game where Greg Inglis had come out and said he was gonna be the best player in the field. Um, it was big, big front page or back page of the sport. I remember cutting it out, putting it on the whiteboard um, and just leaving it there and sort of drawing around it and watching some of the big boys walk in and see it and sort of flare their nostrils. I was like, yes, this is working. This is working. There's nothing I'm going to do about it. He was playing 5'8", so it was, it was, there's nothing I could do to be better than Greg Inglis, but seeing those big boys flare their nostrils, I was like, here we go. And, uh, yeah, I mean, to, you know, we did talk about coming home and playing the next week before the game, so we were pretty confident. And one thing I'll never forget when on the plane home, I uh, forget who was talking about it, but they were talking about Wayne Scarra, who was our CEO at the time, yep. had already organized extra seating for the stadium. We got there for training and it was half built already, so he'd already planned in place for us to win and for him to, um, you know, expand the crowd by an extra five or six thousand because he knew he'd sell it out. He had that in place, so. Uh, yeah, Wayne, I was pretty pretty confident. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Confident. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you're damn right you're unbeatable at home because the next week we played the Roosters at home in another blackout game similar to... Yeah, the in unbelievable. In front of a heaving Mount Smart crowd. I've never, yep. It's one of the best atmospheres coming through the TV I can ever remember at Mount Smart. Yep. Um, we had uh, Lucky on the, on the show a few weeks ago and he said that this yep. was one of the highlights of his career. Is that how you remember that game? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the fondest memories I have the whole time I played footy. Um, um, to run out there, I love how we used to run out to Mount Smart Stadium through the tunnel uh, yes. from the training field, um, and you have the drums and that. And coming out of that tunnel with the fire and the drums, and then looking up at the crowd, which is totally blacked out, absolutely packed. Um, I always made it a, a point to run to the middle of the field, and then. Um, you know, do just sort of just do a 360 degree turn and have a look at the crowd. And, and um, yeah, I'll never forget the way it looked that day. It was 100%. Everybody was wearing black clothes and um, this crowd was just heaving, just pumped up. And uh, yeah, it was unbelievable. That, um, that Roosters game is synonymous for that uh, Ruben running the ball back into yeah, Isaiah right. Soliola, yeah. <laughs> knocking him out. Yeah. Um, how close were you to that play when it happened? And is it true Ruben was yelling Spartan? As he crashed into the defence, <laughs> I was I was in the front line, so I'd just kick a goal. Um, so I'd just run back to the front line, so I didn't have to go all the way back. Um, and I remember watching Rubes run back, and one hundred percent he was screaming Sparta. Oh, <laughs> it was around that time at three hundred. Yeah, that's and what he I was thought. Screaming yeah. it, screaming it, and he was running that hard. Like I, I can't believe that um, Tolly Avi. Soliola even stood in front of him. There's no way I would have just got out of the road. He was running like like a steam train, and and they hit like you know it was huge, huge collision, and and um, Soliola come flying, and and Rubes was like, yeah, sweet. And then as soon as he realised Soliola was hurt, then he actually I think he went and sort of picked him up. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The whole game. It's just the kind of there's the kind of guy that Ruben is, like just such a, a lovely bloke, an absolute gentleman. I feel like. An absolute privilege that I got to play with him and my team, and um, yeah, but I certainly wouldn't have got in front of him that day. <laughs> well, I don't think any of us would. <laughs> no. we, so, so after the uh, the you know the excitement of that game, we move on to the the preliminary final against Manly. Yeah, unfortunately, we're soundly beaten by a very good Manly side that year. Yeah, um, yep. but the two thousand and eight season must still hold sort of many special memories for you. Yeah, it does. It was probably one of the um, it's probably my best year. Um, as you say, I sort of had injury through the middle of the year where I, I, I ripped up my muscle off the bone uh, and missed a few games. But uh, yeah, the, the way that it, um, well, certainly the run that we had there at the back end of the year uh, was something I'll never forget and probably the, the most enjoyable time I had playing footy, yeah. Um, the 2009 
season, the, the club welcomes back Stacey Jones and they signed Joel Moon. Um, yeah. Now that I've read this, that you were apparently told by the club that you weren't, that they weren't planning on using you for the 2009 season. And instead you'd be looking to play in the Balkans if you stayed on. Yeah. That, that must've been a tough thing to hear considering how integral you were to the club for the, in the success for the previous two seasons. Yeah, I was shocked. Uh, I was shocked. I just had a meeting at the end of the year, like you always do, um, and got called in all meeting with the coaches. And they basically just said, um, yeah, and it was exact words, because I'll never forget it. It doesn't matter how good you play, you'll never play first grade at this club again. And I was, I was really caught off guard. Um, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, they basically said they were going in a different route. Um, the thing that really, I said, sort of got me is three or four weeks prior, I'd I had a huge offer to go play in England. Um, and so we asked the club, so my manager asked the club, well, what's your plans for Michael? Because he's got a really big offer. Uh, I still remember John Hart pulling me aside and said, mate, we've got huge plans for you and we want to extend you after this one year. So um, I was really excited by that. And I said, well, if you guys want to keep me, I, I don't want to go. I love it here. So um, I was excited by that. And then, as you say, sort of got, I don't know where it sort of happened over the next couple of weeks. Um, um, that yeah, things change for the club, and that's that's fair enough. That's professional, professional sport. But um, caught me off guard, uh, and I didn't know, yeah, I didn't know what to do. To be fair, yeah, yeah. Well, you you first linked to a move to Penrith or Melbourne. However, you yep. decide to switch codes and you go to a Otago yeah. Rugby. So how did yep. you find the code switch? And had you ever played Union before? Not really. I played a little bit of um, rugby union at school, but um, John Hart was uh, pretty pivotal in that. Uh, I spoke with Hardy about it and uh, he had a idea that I'd be pretty good at rugby union in terms of my, the assets that I had from rugby league that would translate with my kicking game and, and obviously my goal kicking um, would be good in rugby. Um, I was pretty excited by the prospect. I met with uh, Wayne Smith, who was the assistant coach of the All Blacks. Um, and I met with the Blues coach at the airport one day in Auckland. They sold me the, the uh, idea uh, yeah, you said I had offered to go to, to Melbourne um, more so than Penrith, really. Uh, but it just, yeah, the timing of it at Melbourne, they had no money in their salary cap, to be, to be quite honest. Um, and uh, it just worked out better. My wife was pregnant at the time. So, um, yeah, we decided to take the plunge and go to Rugby Union. And, and to be fair, at the time, it was something I was really, really excited about. You... um. 2010 to 2013, you go over to England and you have stints yeah. with the Crusaders, the Welsh-based Crusaders and the London Broncos. Yep. Um, how did you enjoy your time playing in the Super League overseas and what were the main differences between the speed of the game and, and the defensive structures in comparison to the NRL? Yeah, it's, it was a faster game. Um, and I'd say real physical um, in terms of the hits but not so much on the ground. The wrestle hadn't really made it to the Super League at that time. Um, during the sort of back end of my time there, uh, Maguire was coach. He'd moved from Melbourne over to Coach Wigan, and that's when the the, uh, the wrestling that, that Melbourne were doing started to come into the game. But it's certainly a more open game over there, uh, a lot more points. Um, it's good to shift the ball around. Um, certainly not in the start of the season. Uh, because it's uh, it's still pretty wet and cold, mm. but uh, when it starts to heat up, um, you get to shift the ball around a lot, and yeah, it's, it's a good brand of footy. No one knows you over there, so it's good you can sort of relax a little bit. Um, yeah. Mm. But yeah, we we love their time in England. Yeah, you returned to the NRL though for the 2014 season, so you signed with yep. St George Illawarra, and you played the first four games of the year, and then unfortunately you're injured, and the Dragons end up signing Benji Marshall um, to come yeah. back and in your absence, and then you end up retiring in the end of 2014. So yep. how do you, how do you look back on your career after that? Um, yeah, look, it's, I guess as a kid, all I wanted to do was play in the NRL. I was lucky enough to, to accomplish that and do it for an extended period of time. Um, no doubt I would like to do more. I was close a couple of times to playing representative footy, uh, but never got there. Uh, but on a whole, I think that, um, you know, I, I guess it was a privilege to play as much as I did. We had a bit of fair bit of bad luck along the route, mm. uh, but that's you know not many people have their careers go exactly the plan. And um, at the end of the day, I'm really happy that uh, I got to do that for a job for a, uh, a long time. 
met some amazing people that are still my best best mates today and um, people that you haven't seen for years and years and you bump into them after you played together and it's just um, like you never uh, left each other. So, you know, privileged to get paid to play a sport, I, I would have did for nothing. Yeah, footy's good like that. It's um, it There's so many NRL stars that dabble in boxing. Now, you were a champion junior boxer growing up in Queensland. Did you ever consider going back to, to boxing after you retired? Yeah, I uh, actually did. Oh. I... Um, yeah, I had one professional fight. Um, so, yeah, I did a bit of boxing when I was a kid. And um, I'd asked a couple of times while I was playing in England if I could have a fight, but the club wouldn't let me. Uh, so when I retired, I, I did uh, have a professional fight. Um, I fought a guy in Toowoomba, back in my hometown. I went back to my old trainer um, that I trained with when I was a kid. So we went sort of full circle. Um, he'd taken some guys to win world titles. So he was pretty uh, well-credentialed and... Um, so I went back and, yeah, had a, had one fight with him. Um, but, yeah, it was a pretty crazy night, to be honest. So I, I did win the fight, uh, one more knockout in the first round. Nice. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, it was a bit weird, really. Um, you sort of train so hard and it sort of happened really quickly. So I don't know whether I'm any good or not or I just caught him with a lucky shot. But, uh, yeah, it sort of happened. And then later that night, uh, my trainer, his his son, his son passed away in a fight. Um, oh. from a brain bleed yeah so it was one of those ones where it was something that I was going to have a few fights and that sort of happened and and uh, yeah stuff changed pretty quickly to be fair wow. it was a pretty sad mm. pretty sad um, pretty sad evening yeah yeah oh <laughs> yeah not to, not to kill the buzz but yeah no no not to get fighting fan. not to get too morbid or anything yeah. like that but did he actually pass away in the ring or did he pass away no no, he didn't. He he, uh, he was his first loss. Uh, he'd never lost before. Braden Smith is his name, a champion young kid. He was 23 years of age, um, just about to finish law school. He's a very bright young man. Um, had a fight. He fought a guy, I think, from Thailand, from memory. Um, really tough fight. Uh, he took some punches. You know, he, he did get beat. Never went down in the whole fight. Uh, just kept coming forward. Actually, he came up to me after the fight. Uh, I had a good chat with him about it. Um, I'd known him since he was a, a baby, basically. Yep. Um, and he just asked me, we were talking about the fight, and I just said I'd never been prouder of him, the, the way that he actually fought. We were having a full conversation. Uh, mm. And um, the strange one is his, uh, he asked, could we have a photo together? That's the last photo that you know Braden ever had was with me. Wow. Um, and we all sort of went to go off to the after, after fight night function. Um, there for sort of half an hour, an hour, and we said we sort of hadn't hadn't seen him and what was happening, and uh, basically went into the dressing room to get his bag and um, collapsed, uh, had a and had a brain bleed, and they they raced him to Brisbane, but um, yeah, unfortunately they he, he never come out of his uh, his uh, I guess I think it's a coma or whether it was you know he never yeah. come back awake anyway, so um, yeah, super sad time for boxing uh, worldwide, Australia wide certainly, and. Uh, Toowoomba it took a big chunk out of the, the, the city. Yeah. And it probably mm. was the re- is that the reason you didn't fight again? It just kind of changed your whole oh, It did. Uh, part of the reason was that um, I'd discussed it with my wife, um, with Brendan, who's his father, and who was my trainer, he was yep. my trainer when I was a kid. He was the only guy that I ever trusted to go and train with. Uh, that's not to say there isn't, isn't uh, other good trainers around, but I knew that Brendan would never, ever throw me into a fight to sell tickets because he's a promoter yep. as well. It was never going to leverage off my sporting background as a, as a rugby league player to, to um, yeah, sell, get bums on seats or anything like that. I knew he'd always um, do the right thing by me. Um, and I was very confident with him. Um, so that's probably why. It, it obviously dented him for a long time. He got out of boxing. Uh, he's back in it now. Um, not going to lie, I floated, uh, floated with the idea a couple of times of fighting again. Uh, we've had a couple of training camps and uh, fights just sort of haven't haven't fallen into place at the time, but um, you know, I guess you never say never. But uh, I'm no, starting just, to get a bit old now. Dumb. Bro, you're I'm 37 young. now. I'm 37. That's young, now. bro. That's, That's still young. young. <laughs> yeah, that is young. <laughs> what what do you what what do you think of? Um, I know we're branching away from stuff here, but I'm nah. cu- curious to know your your opinion. What do you think of the guys that have made the jump from rugby league to boxing? Are they doing? The, are they doing the sport justice, like boxing justice, um, or yeah, 
uh, are some of them kind of, do you look and think why? Like, well, put it this way, if you're a very brave man to step inside a boxing ring. Um, yep. Once you go in there, there's, there's no support. You're in there on your own. Mm. Um, I look at a bloke like uh, Paul Gallon doing what he's doing. Um, the thing is, any, and I can understand that boxers get a little bit upset because um, the football players come in and get paid more money. But yep. any boxer in the world, anywhere, they can grab a pair of boots and go and jump in and play in a local footy team. Yeah, that's right. It's, they, they can do that yep. simply because that it's all about money. It's business. Uh, these footy players can put bums on seats and people want to watch them fight. If you look at Gal, for example, he half the people turn up, they want to see him get belted. and Half the people turn up and see him want to win. Uh, yeah. At the end of the day, uh, they turn up and want to see him. So you can't really say that he's taken away from other boxers because he fights on cards and brings other fighters into those cards that make yeah. a lot more money than they would have made elsewhere. Yeah. Um, he's done it with Tim Zhu. Um, he's done it with a couple of the other guys there that have sort of fought on his undercard and are starting to progress to that next level. So, no, I, I don't think I don't think they're doing boxing any harm at all. If you look at a guy, again, he's doing it full-time now, Gallon, and yeah, he trains right. his butt off. He doesn't turn up in, in terrible shape and, and mm. just try and jump in and grab a few quid. Like, And he's not going in there and fighting um, mailmen either. He's fighting guys that are tough, scary men. And so he's, he's full tilt. It's his speed as a, as a heavyweight too. Like he comes out of the gate so quickly. Um, he's got a big motor. He lasts a long time. It's similar to when he plays yeah. footy, right? Um, yeah, just cardio. He's got a cardio engine that, that just doesn't stop. And um, um, you can hit him with a, a crowbar. He'll keep coming. So he's – no, I think he's doing fantastic things for boxing. I think he always carried himself in a, in a professional manner. He always turns up in great physical condition. Um, yep. So you certainly can't take away from him. And as I say um, – I understand people want to cry about him getting so much money, but you know, if you look at uh, Big Daddy Brown, who he just fought, he he would have, he got five times the amount of money to fight Gallon than he would have got fighting some someone else. So mm, you know, right. you can't complain. No, well, he was one of the ones that was very vocal about Gallon yeah, he was. Um, fights away from reputable fighters, and he gets yep. in the ring and, and he he doesn't last a round. So exactly know. right, yeah, and um, yeah, no, I think they're doing great things for. Great things for boxing. I, and I, I feel, though, you definitely, if you want to get into the ring, you've got to be prepared to take the barrage that comes with it of being a football player yeah. and uh, all that sort of nonsense, um, which is part of the reason I wanted to do it on a small show because it was about me and it wasn't about anybody else. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the guys, most of the guys that are doing it are turn up, you know, in great physical condition. They're not just turning up and stuffing around, you know. At the end of the day, um, as I said, it's a daunting place and... Uh, no, you, if you're prepared to put in a hard, tough training camp, um, you know, credit to you. Yep. Yeah. Well, you, you do end up following a, a slightly different career path. So you've moved uh, you've moved up to God's country in the Gold Coast and <laughs> yeah. uh, you're now working as a real estate agent. So how'd you get into yeah. that? Yeah, mate, I sort of, uh, I run a development company with my brother whilst I was playing footy. Uh, so it's something that I always had a bit of a passion for. Um, yeah, we used to buy, sell properties and build houses and flip houses whilst we were, whilst you were playing footy and my old man was a builder. So um, used to, you know, being around houses and properties and stuff like that. So it was kind of a, a natural progression for me, I guess, once I, I'd retired. Um, originally, I decided I wasn't going to do it. My mate uh, kept trying to get me to do it. But I said, I've been working weekends my whole life. Like, I want to have some, some weekends yeah. off. But, uh, you know, it's something that I enjoy. Um, and hence the reason I, I got into it. And, um, yeah, I'm pretty lucky to be able to sell houses here in the Gold Coast. It's a, it's a pretty special place. Yeah, not a bad spot to be. Yeah. There's a there's a lot of ex footy players up there now, um, who are involved in coaching or or um, like training or, or running water for many of the clubs up there. Like Scotty Prince is coaching. I think he coached the Valley Diehards women's side this year. He did yeah. No, um, Clinton Burt. Torpy's coaching an A grade side up there. Uh, yes. Luke Burt runs the water for the Burley Bears. Have yep. you ever thought about doing anything in regards to footy? Uh, again, yeah, like I, coaching or training. This year, I did my first head coach's job. Um, oh, nice. I, yeah, I coached the Burley Bears Melmaninga Cup team. Oh, um, so it's, okay. it's, only a, it's only a short season, uh, so yep. it's much like the SG Ball competition in Sydney. Uh, but with my work, it was it's been always a little bit difficult. But given that the Melmaninga Cup's only that sort of shorter six to eight week season, I'd managed to get it in, and it's something I really enjoyed. I like working with guys that are at that age. Um, where you feel like you can influence them maybe a little bit as a footballer, but certainly as a, 
as a human being and as a gentleman. Yeah. And um, we certainly had that in my team that there was a no, um, a no dickhead policy, I guess you call it, for want of a better term. Um, but managed to, yeah, work with some great young kids, some kids that are um, signed to the Titans and Broncos and uh, some other kids that managed to get some contracts uh, after the year played out. So um, some kids with big futures there and hopefully that um, yeah, I can continue to help them move forward. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's great to see everyone. Yeah, you're still involved in rugby league. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Michael, I'm going to ask you some questions that we ask all of our guests. This is rapid oh. fire questions. While Hammer okay. over here look, goes through some of the uh, the get some audience questions. Okay, who right. was your toughest teammate? Toughest teammate, Ruben Wiki. Yeah, nice one. Yeah. Who is the best sledger? Ooh, Nathan Fiend was good. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we've uh, discussed that. We've witnessed we? a bit of that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who was the biggest pest? Oh, jeez. Tough question. Oh. Don't have to be the Warriors, just anyone you played any, with. Any, with yeah. any teams you played for, yeah. Biggest pest. Uh, biggest pest. Uh, Adam Peake. An older guy, I played oh, yeah. with Parramatta and played yeah. with him over in England as well. He's a bit of a pest. Real, you know, good willed. But I do remember it coming into my locker one day and uh, my socks were on fire. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> actually, George Gaddis. George Gaddis. Oh, oh yeah. George one of the glorious greats. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he <laughs> someone, Tony Martin actually did something to his locker and he, he knew it was either me or Tozza and he said, if you don't own up, I'm going to burn all your stuff. And I thought, he won't do that. He started sending us videos. He captured, like, emptied our lockers and had all our gear out in Ellerslie in the field out there. And he's going, if you don't tell me, it's going to burn. And then he sent us videos of him burning all their stuff. So uh, he's a he's a proper pest too, Gaddis. Wow. Hooker, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's hooker. Yeah, hookers. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> who, was, uh, who was your toughest toughest opponent? Toughest opponent, um, most intimidating was uh, Morley, Adrian Morley. I yeah, remember yeah. playing against him. It was quite intimidating. Toughest opponent, um, Mick Crocker. Mick Crocker was a really yeah. tough guy. Always, um, always heckled you and got at you all day, and and always made your job tough. I could fucking believe that. Yeah. <laughs> um, who's the best trainer that you played with? Best trainer, um, Adam Dykes. Adam Dykes is a guy at uh, Parramatta. He came from Cronulla. He was the fittest, the fittest guy I'd ever, ever played with. Uh, we did a, a crazy run in Kuyama one day where we had to do sand dunes and a real long distance run. And he was that fit. He was that far in front, but he ran so hard. He passed out on the beach and they couldn't get him off the beach. They had to call in a helicopter to elevate him out of the beach. Like he, he ran himself to an absolute standstill with, uh, he was super fit. That is super nice, fit. Eh? There you go. What about the team comedian? Who's the, who's the funniest bloke you played with? Jesus, plenty of them. <laughs> plenty of them. <laughs> plenty of rat bags <laughs> along the way. Yeah. Plenty of rat bags along the way. Um, both the Stewart boys at, at uh, Manly, they were absolute oh, rat okay. bags. Um, loved a good time. Uh, Matty Peterson at Parramatta. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sideshow, yeah, yeah. Sideshow, yeah. Sideshow, he lives here on the Gold Coast. So, oh, um, cool. yeah, just up the road from me. So, I go and get he runs a tyre shop. So, I always go see uh, Maddie for, for tyres. Uh, he hooks us up all the time. Um, but he's a rat bag. Uh, Hendo, Hendo is another Hendo, one. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but lucky enough to play with plenty of good characters. Did you, um, did you have any pre game rituals or game day routines that you followed religiously? Yeah, I did. I had plenty. Everything I did on game day was was religious, uh, superstitious to a point. But I think a lot of it was that I knew uh, exactly my routine. I knew that I'd turn up and it was okay right from the meals that I ate, the times that I ate, the way that I packed my bag, um, the way that I got dressed, the, the undies that I wore, everything. Absolutely everything was done the same the same way every week so that I, I knew that uh, never forget anything and there was no excuses. OCD. Um, yeah. What was the most memorable moment in your career? 
Uh, I probably think we spoke about there before the, the night we had the blackout and we played the um, the Roosters back at Mount Smart. Something that uh, is super fond memories. Yeah, beautiful. Did you have any heroes growing up? Rugby league heroes growing up, or boxing heroes? Yeah, definitely both. I had uh, Robbie Davis was yep. my hero, yep. um, a Toowoomba boy who'd gone mm. and played in the uh, the big show to show me that um, it was possible. And yep. I used to love Jeff Fennick as well. Jeff Fennick, I remember watching a, his fight with Azuma Nelson uh, when he yeah. fought in the car park over in uh, Las Vegas and they robbed him. Yep. Uh, I remember crying. I was crying when Guts out that uh, he'd, he'd been ripped off and giving him a draw. I remember my dad like going, are you serious? I'm like, they robbed him. Like, it was devastated. <laughs> so he was certainly a boxing idol and, and Rocky Balboa also used to follow him. I, I wouldn't be Rocky. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't hate. To, I hate to break it to you, mate, but he's not a real person. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Don't believe it. <laughs> uh, who were your best and worst roommates when you travel? Because obviously you had roommates when you travelled to Australia. When did? You yeah, yeah. Did a, lot, did a lot of travel. Obviously at the Warriors every other week. So Grant Ravelli was my roommate for an extended oh, yeah. period, and Nathan Fiend, both pretty good. Um, Ravsy was pretty messy. Pretty messy, uh, but a good dude. He come in, he come in a bit um, under the weather, and it was always my job to be the alarm clock and make sure he's up and ready to go. Uh, and then when I when I played in England, Craig Gow was my roommate. We played oh, at London together. That could have got, got messy. Yeah, he, he enjoyed a good time. A couple of uh, um, bedtime wrestles. Uh, yeah. but again, we snored too. So um, I always made sure that I had all the pillows on my bed, and I'd just start pegging them at him. Um, you'd only have to hit him a couple of times. You'd roll over and he was okay, but his snoring wasn't great. What? Um, who was the hardest team to come up against? Um, I, I remember playing against Manly after I'd left Manly. I always thought they were really tough. They were at a really um, successful period as well. Yeah, um, they were at that team. They always yeah. come hard, always come hard. Every player would really test you. Um, so I remember playing against them. They were hard. In my early years playing against the Warriors too, uh, very daunting to go over to Mount Smart. I remember when I first was at Parramatta and we come over to play some of the, the big guys and there was a couple of stinks that broke out. and I'd ended up in, in front of Monty Beetham and thought, oh, my Ooh. God, my life's just finished. <laughs> uh, another, so they, they, they were a daunting boxer. pack. Here's another boxer. Yeah. yeah. Well, look at what Monty did. I mean, he was he was amazing when he went into boxing, you know. Yeah. Such a such a freakish athlete, you know. And yeah. um, I certainly don't think anyone could say that he did boxing any harm. Yeah, Exactly. Um, who was the biggest influence on your career? Um, probably sounds a bit a bit uh, weird, but probably my wife, really. Like, she was always there for me. We, we moved around a lot. Um, we were high school sweethearts. She moved to Sydney with me. Every every bad situation we went through together, we did a lot of it away from our families. Um, you know, it's certainly in, in Auckland and over in the UK. We had kids away from home. So she was always my sounding board. Um, and I was very lucky to have yeah a, a partner like that. So she's a local Toowoomba girl as well. Toowoomba girl as well, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, we, we went to high school together. Um, and she she moved around everywhere with me and never never kicked up a stink really. Um, woman, mate, that's a good woman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's been trying to get away ever since, but uh, <laughs> we got locked in here now. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on the new six again rule? I like it. Yeah, I like it. Um, I feel like it speeds up the game. It brings the smaller guys back into the game. That fatigue back into the game, which was taken out there for for an extended period as well. So um, I think you can see some of the skillful guys that are really coming to the forefront at the moment. Uh, so yeah, I, I tend to like the rule. Um, I don't know whether you're going to ask me the next question about the head high rule. I think no, that's no, a bit, I'm not going to ask. It's a bit iffy, but uh, I certainly like the six again one. Yeah, um, and. If you didn't become an NRL player way back when, in like 99, if you didn't get the scholarship in 99, what yep. career path do you think you would have taken back then? Yeah, look, I probably, as I said, my, my old man, he owned his own building business. So it probably would have been something something in the construction industry, um, which wouldn't have been such a bad thing. We're about to do some renos here. And I tell you what, 
what these tradies charge, man. They're, they're making Mate, big cash. Careful what you say. <laughs> careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. I am a tradie. We we've got to live too, mate. <laughs> I know. I know. Charge like a wounded bull. I, I get I get sent through some uh, quotes here at the moment. I think the guy's wearing a balaclava when he's sending them through. <laughs> mate, I'll, I'll I'll send you my because uh, my daughter lives up uh, the Gold Coast now, and her partner's a, a carpenter. Um, yeah, sweet. I'll send you his details, um, right and, and he can give you a competitive price. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. Too easy. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Have Mate, you, I, you, I just really want to thank t- you. Just one more, just one more thing. Have you got yeah. a tip for tomorrow yeah. night? Oh yeah, your tip for tomorrow. Well, he's going to say Queensland. What? It's got to be Queensland. You, know, you can never, you can never go against Queensland. Even yeah. if we were playing, we had a preschool team going against New South Wales. I'd still, I'd still pick Queensland. No doubt, as always, we're the underdogs, but. Um, uh, for some reason, when these guys put on that uh, maroon jersey, they just seem to That's lift it. another leg. Yeah, so, uh, I'm yeah. Queensland through and through. Yeah, beautiful. Queensland, Mate, uh, just yeah. want to thank you for coming on, chatting with us um, so candidly too. We Every time we have a guest on, we learn something new. Um, sure, so, yeah. learning that the, the beards weren't growing for, for in Ruben's honour was something that we well, didn't know. Yeah. Um, I saw, I saw <laughs> yeah. As I said to you before we went on air, mate, our, fellow, our followers um, love hearing... Uh, about our past players, what you're up to. Um, so, yeah, thanks for giving us your time tonight. Uh, as we always say, it doesn't matter who you played for before or after your time at the Warriors. Um, once you play for the club, you are forever and always. And you, Michael Witt, are forever and always Warrior 134. Thank you so much, guys. A privilege. Thank yeah, you. thanks. And I'm hoping we may we may be able to catch up with you in round 25 when the Warriors play the Titans. And yeah. See Super well, Stadium. um... Yeah, Mark. Mark um, is no, no. Mark, the owner of the club. Oh yeah, ah, Robo. Yeah, Robo lives just up the road. Well, just did live up the road from me. I sold his house uh, oh, just recently, oh. so um, so he's moved just up the road. But yeah, he's always talking to. Um, he's got a box um, up there at Titan, so we're always talking about getting down and watching the footy. So, yeah, that sounds like a plan. Beautiful, awesome. mate. Can't wait for that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again, Mick. Appreciate awesome. It. Pleasure, guys. No worries Thanks, at all. Buddy. Good luck. With Thanks it. a lot. See you later. Yeah.